Hey, folks, we're back. Today we're going to look at OSHA. Now, if you have already listened to the wage and hour lecture, um, I had mentioned that you may wish to use some type of non-regulated substances to keep your attention at its peak. If you thought that wage and hour stuff was fun, this one, this one's great. So OSHA was enacted in 1970, and it created the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. And it's basically responsible for workplace safety. Well, it is, for the most part, done by federal OSHA covering you or a federal OSHA-approved state agency that does it. So now here's the kicker. Family-owned and operated funeral homes which do not hire anyone as employees are not required to comply with OSHA because OSHA is for employees. The family-owned funeral home incorporates as a corporation, right? then hires the owner or owners back as employees, funeral homes required to comply with OSHA. Most places do some sort of incorporating or a limited liability company or something. So it gets a little sticky. But obviously as your business grows and you hire an employee, boom, you're under. OSHA does not cover self-employed persons. So a sole proprietorship with the owner being the only employee is not covered. Just because you are not covered may not necessarily mean you will not be inspected to make sure that you are not doing something silly, okay? That would be important. So overview. Now, I am giving you the latest information directly from OSHA. The book may be, have some things in discrepancy. I am telling you for the purposes of the class, this is the important information you need to have because this is what the law is. If you have a fatality, or three people are injured and require hospitalization in the workplace, you must report to OSHA within eight hours of the or the incident that caused the injury. It, may, it must be made in person to the area OSHA office, so you have to show up and knock on their door, or you call the 800 number. I know the book says five people over 48 hours. This is incorrect as of July 2014, right from the OSHA website. Funeral homes are classified as a low-hazard industry. Okay, we're generally exempt from OSHA illness and accident reports. We'll talk about that a little later. So what happens? There's an opening conference by the OSHA team prior to the inspection to discuss a situation. There's going to be a walk around and tour the facility. Interviews will occur following the inspection, following the interviews, closing conference to discuss all unsafe or unhealthful conditions, and all apparent violations uh, for which a citation will be discussed will be then presented to the employer. Compliance officer will submit a report to OSHA. It has recommendations on penalties, and the air director may issue citations and then propose the penalty. Once you get the issued citation or notice of penalty, the employer can request an informal meeting to discuss the case. But if the employer does not contest the citation, correct the hazard, get it all done, by the date listed, or you have a problem. So with wage and hour, you're forced to display the wage and hour poster. With OSHA, you're forced to require the job safety and health protection poster 2203 or this. And this needs to be someplace it can be seen. That's the trick. It says time clock, entrance, where blah, 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 blah. Some place employees are likely to see it. If you know no one uses your break room, your break room is probably the wrong place for it. Funeral homes are exempt from basic record keeping unless Bureau of Labor Statistics informs a funeral form it must keep them. Some states do require the documentation. Basic record keeping involves use of OSHA Form 200, which is a log and summary of illnesses and injury regarding your employees, uh, regarding their exposure at the workplace. Not that they got the sniffles, okay, and they came in with the flu, but while they were there, they got sick because of something. And then OSHA Form 101, which details the incident listed in the log. In the event of an accident, the funeral home involving the death of the hospitalization, as we discussed earlier, um, the accident must be reported, as we said, okay, within eight hours. I believe I have the five up there. I think that should be a three because of the previous slide, right? So I'll, I will fix that. It is three. 
The report must explain the circumstances, number of fatalities, extent of injuries. So when you visit or call in, you need to tell them everything you possibly can. So medical records. You need to be able to provide to your employees medical records at a reasonable time, place, and manner within 15 working days, 15 business days, basically two weeks, right? They need to be made available to the employee or designated representative. Employer may require the requesting party only such info should be readily known to the requested and which may be necessary to locate or identify records, date, name, locations, etc. You can't be a jerk about this and say you want their grandparents' names, mothers' names, their date of births, their social securities, just in an attempt to not give them medical records. If a requesting party wants a copy of a record, the employer must provide a copy of the record without cost to the employer representative. Or you have to provide a way to copy it without cost to the employee or representative. Or you loan it to the employee representative for them to make a copy and give them a reasonable time to do it. Now, if you think that's a bad idea, you're probably right. You're better off just making the copy without cost and getting it over with rather than giving them your copy in case it walks away because then you are in violation of OSHA. You don't have the records. You can charge a reasonable non-discriminatory administrative cost, search and copying expense or whatever. But, and here's the thing, the employer may not charge for any new information that may be added. Okay? After the initial copy has been made, they're good. You may not charge for any new information that may be added after the fact. The employer cannot charge for an initial request by a recognized or certified bargaining agent, bargaining agent for a copy of an employee exposure record or analysis using exposure medical records. So what is this saying? The way I keep this straight in my head, and I suggest it for you, is ask yourself, is this the first time a copy of that particular item is being made? As an example, John Smith goes into his construction office, requests his medical records, 1995. And they give him his copy, 1995, two days later, no ifs, ands, or buts, he's got everything he needs. He goes in five years later, 2000, asks for the medical records since 1995. He is entitled to a free copy of all the information since his last report, right? The employer may not charge for any new information that may have been added. But if he wants all of it all over again, the employer can charge for the initial one in 1995, because that's a duplicate, and a new one. The new stuff cannot be charged. The employer, say they work with a union, and the union says, hey, we need the medical records, because this is going to determine what type of bargaining agreement we bring to the table. That does not impact the employee. Okay? They have to provide the union their copy, and then when the employee comes in and wants a copy, that is fine cannot charge for it. When a business ends, the business must transfer all employee records to the successor business. And if there is no successor business, the employer has to try to notify all employees three months prior to cessation and then contact OSHA to determine how to store. Funeral homes are subject to the same general requirements that apply to all employers subject to OSHA. Fire extinguishers, lighting of exits, blah -de blah 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 tons of stuff in the book as to what you have to do. The most common item that you get busted on in an ocean inspection at a funeral home is you forget to have the first aid kit and fire extinguisher in your fleet vehicles. Okay? I'm telling you right now. If you work at a funeral home, go look in your removal van, go look in your hearse, go look in your lead car, go look in your flower van. You need to have a first aid kit and a fire extinguisher in every one of them. And that's generally where they dink most funeral homes because we don't put something, say, in the flower van because we don't think about it. If it's an company vehicle that has to have the OSHA stuff. So specific OSHA standards that apply to funeral homes, not just for funeral homes, but apply to funeral homes. Formaldehyde exposure this took effect in 1988, purpose to establish permissible exposure levels for formaldehyde in the workplace. And there's three exposure levels. The first one is the time-weighted average. We take that over an eight-hour work period, and it cannot exceed 0.75 parts per million. We have a short-term exposure limit, or STEL, which is a 15-minute test, cannot exceed two parts per million. And then an action level. 
This is very similar to the time-weighted average over an eight-hour work period and cannot exceed 0.5 ppm. If 0.5 ppm is exceeded and it is below the 0.75 time-weighted average, your action level area and need to take steps to reduce exposure. Every funeral home with employees required to conduct formaldehyde monitoring of a preparation room. Obviously, if you don't have a prep room, you're not going to go to your central prep and worry about it. Your central prep is, has to worry about it. Time-weighted average needs to be taken during peak activities, your busiest shift, basically, the busiest time. The short-term exposure limit should actually be taken during an embalming. The tests are done concurrently. So while you are taking your time-weighted average over that eight-hour shift when you're about to embalm, you break out the badge for the short-term exposure limit for 15 minutes, and then after 15 minutes, you seal it up, continue the shift for everything else. Once you get the results, you have 15 days to tell your employees. Retesting for formaldehyde is done. Whenever changes are made in procedures, personnel, equipment, reports of signs or symptoms of exposure, or other areas that may cause levels of formaldehyde to increase, and all monitoring records are placed in permanent record. Under formaldehyde rule, standard responsibilities are protective equipment, funeral home provides it, or the employer must provide it. Um, at no cost, and they're provided to any employee that has potential to come into contact with formaldehyde. And it tells you what the PPPs are, PPEs are. Any contaminated clothing must be cleaned or stored with adequate warning so that those who handle it know it's contaminated. Now, if your short-term limit is below 2, okay, if your time-weighted average is below 0.5, the action level, you're in compliance. There is nothing you need to do. While you're in compliance, PPE is the big thing. Telling people you have contaminated clothing or whatever, okay? You need to have change rooms, change from work clothes to personal protection equipment, drench showers, if you could become splashed with solution containing 1% or greater. Those of you that have had some embalming classes, you should be able to tell me what the recommended dilution of a formaldehyde solution is in your embalming tank. Hypotonic at... 2%, so every prep room needs to have a drench shower. Showers need to be in the immediate work vicinity. You should have to walk across the parking lot. And you should be able to get drenched for 15 to 20 minutes, which you can imagine is all sorts of fun when you're in full PPEs and stand under the shower for nearly half an hour. You also need to have an eye wash station with eye wash sink. You can't just have the bottles. You must have an actual sink. Flush, just like the shower, has to be able to run continually. Housekeeping, visual inspection of the prep room detects spills or leaks are required. You should clean spills or leaks immediately wearing proper protection. Formaldehyde waste should be disposed of in sealed containers and with warning labels. And written record of inspection should be maintained. You should walk through and check everything weekly, monthly. I prefer weekly. Obviously, if you're doing a daily thing, your people need to keep your place clean on a daily basis. Emergencies, must have an emergency procedure plan, must have emergency procedure in the event of formaldehyde exposure. Hazard communication, you're required to have a safety data sheet, your book might still reference material safety data sheets, MSDS, the proper term after 2012 is SDS, that was updated, okay? You have to assemble a binder for all the chemicals that you use. Training, you must be trained on the proper use of protective clothing and gear cleaning up of spills, handling of formaldehyde, emergency procedures, and effects of exposure. Acute effects of formaldehyde exposure can affect ingestion, inhalation, dermal, and eye contact. It messes up how you eat, how you breathe, screws up your skin, and totally destroys your eyes. Chronic exposure can result in cancer. It's extremely toxic, and formaldehyde is a known mutagen. It will cause things to go a little crazy if you're trying to start a family. All applicable records, including monitoring records, must be maintained for 30 years. That's why it's placed in your permanent record. Employees should certify they've received training and a written report of the monitoring results. Training is required for anyone who potentially comes into contact. It should happen at initial employment and at annually thereafter. You see what that says. When you are hired, you should get trained, not just prior to exposure. The day that you are there, okay, should be part of your onboarding. If the short-term exposure limit is below 2, 
Okay, the 15-minute test is below 2. The time-weighted average is above 0.5 and below 7.5. You are in the action level. The funeral home must take three steps. Reduction, exposure reduction plan, adopt safe working practices. Periodic monitoring, retest every six months. This is specific to the TWA eight-hour shift and medical surveillance. So the reduction plan, take immediate steps to reduce formaldehyde exposure, including adoption of safe working practices, rearrangement of rooms so fumes flow away from the embalmer, and installation of ventilation fans or other ways to improve uh, air changes per hour. Monitoring. Repeat monitoring every six months until the exposure level falls below the action level. Again, this is specific to the TWA, the eight-hour test. A violation of the short-term exposure limit triggers a 12-month retest. Okay? That is a common, common trip on a test. They're asking you what is the retest limit for a TWA or a STEL or an action level. One is six months, one is 12. The 15-minute test has the 12. Medical surveillance, you must institute medical surveillance for people who are exposed to formaldehyde. This is done if an employee shows signs of exposure or because levels are not in compliance. Medical removal may be in extreme situations. Now look what this says. A person comes to you after working in the prep room and says, man, my throat is all scratchy, my eyes are watery. They're supposed to be put under medical surveillance. You're supposed to go in, do periodic monitoring because you now have an issue. You want to make sure it's not an exposure level. Well, by doing a test, you will know if it is an issue. Medical questionnaire is done under supervision of a licensed medical professional, typically a doctor. You can't just send them to the manager of the facility and have them check off boxes. If the physician believes there is an exposure problem based on the questionnaire, the doctor gives them a medical exam, physical basically. A copy of the physician's written opinion is to be provided to the employee. One copy is maintained in the record for 30 years. Okay? An employee has the right to request a second opinion within 15 days after receiving results from the first. Second opinion is the same. Matters closed. If it's different, third time's a charm. The way to keep this straight in your head is if there is a dispute, the instant you have in formaldehyde, two doctors saying the same exact thing, the matter is closed does not continue after that. So if the second doctor says the same thing, it's done. Second doctor says something different, then the third doctor will confirm one of the previous. It's the way it is. The short-term exposure exceeds 2 and or. The time-weighted average exceeds 0.75. The funeral home must do another three steps. Okay, You must create a written plan. You must have posting of warning signs, stickers and stuff like that, and the issuance of respirators. Now, the embalming, History and Theory by Robert Mayer, and that is the embalming textbook. The actual OSHA guideline, okay, part 1910-148, make no mention of a written plan. The only place it exists is here in the book. However, when looking at several other places, University of Minnesota and some others, the written plan is in all of their standard operating platforms. So I am telling you, like it was taught to me in school, the written plan is when you violate the time-weighted average, 0.75 or higher, and also if you violate the short-term exposure limit of two uh, parts per million. Written plan. It's not just about reducing your stuff. Now Now you have to write down how you're going to do it and follow it. You're going to warn everyone about the dangers of formaldehyde and formaldehyde exposure. Warning signs on doors, on the embalming machine, any containers that contain formaldehyde, like washing machines for towels, any receptacle like biomedical waste, etc. And respirators, you're going to provide respirators at no cost to employees, and that ain't cheap. Respirators are expensive, and so are the filters. So exposure records, okay? Formaldehyde rule record keeping. Exposure records must be kept for 30 years. And I would probably say that those are your everyday monitoring results, stuff like that. Okay? Medical records, employee medical records, are length of employment plus 30 years. Remember, additionally, training must occur at initial assignment. 
not prior to exposure. There's no time limit there. If you are hired at initial assignment, as soon as you are put in that job category, you are trained for it. You can't be doing the job, and they give it to you before you walk in the doors of the prep room, so to speak. Supplemental training is given any time a new formaldehyde hazard is introduced into the workplace, as well as at least annually. Remember that? Employees are retrained annually for the formaldehyde rule. So we've had this philosophical debate for years now. The formaldehyde hazard is introduced into the workplace. Does that mean we start using a new chemical? We need to have a whole battery of training. I do not have a definitive answer to you. Okay, I wish I did. I would probably view a new chemical from a chemical company as not a significant hazard as any other embalming chemical in there. You should obviously tell your employees about this new chemical and have them do their reading on it, but I don't know if that would be a trigger for a quote-unquote annual retrain on everything. I would probably say if you got some brand spanking new thing on the market from someone that was a completely new formulation, completely crazy, you'd probably want to do something. And you said, Professor Finn, why is it so vague like this? Because you have to remember the formaldehyde rule doesn't just apply to funeral homes. It applies to any industry that utilizes formaldehyde. And formaldehyde is a fixing agent. Preservatives we know, but a fixing agent is used extensively in the manufacture of plastics. And obviously, when you're fixing plastics or whatever, probably different compounds from different suppliers. And obviously, a hazard that is brought in, maybe it was a liquid, now it's a powder. Now you have to train everyone extensively because now you have even more of a particulate inhalation risk. So I did create a video on YouTube. You can go click on the button and watch it. I'm going to walk you through it now. This is a quick way for you to basically practice so you can draw a graph to keep yourself on the up and up with it. So draw yourself a box, a big rectangle, and draw a line down the middle. Put TWA on top, still on the bottom. Indicate your major violations, violation of the time-weighted average and your short-term exposure limit, 2.0, 0 0.75. Then draw another line for your action level, 0 0.5. Write the word compliance. You want to know that there is nothing you need to do. If you want, you can color in the pictures. You're not going to be able to do that probably on your tests or whatever, but you can do that in your notes. But definitely write in what you need to do with those levels. And write in compliance, nothing to be done. Do not round numbers. Okay, if it reads 0.99, you are in compliance. It doesn't matter. 2.0 is 2.0 or better. I tell you again, the time-weighted average test, the eight-hour test is always six months. The short-term exposure less is always a 12-month. Look at the question you are trying to answer. When you're asked to determine proper test periods, always look at your scenario. If it doesn't specify, I'm probably going to tell you, go with the more strict test. So if you have a violation of both the permissible exposure limit under the time-weighted average, 0.75, and a violation of the short-term exposure limit, uh, which the permissible exposure limit is 2.0, you should probably retest within six months. If it says something along the lines of, what is the earliest you could retest? What is the latest you could retest under the short-term exposure limit? 12-month retest. Um, use your best judgment when looking at questions. Okay, Use your best judgment. And explain yourself. If you have the chance to comment, like you do on your national exam, comment, okay, comment. So formaldehyde's done. It's a good hazard communication. It took effect in 1988. The standard is a disclosure law so that employees are provided information regarding the hazardous materials they are working with. Four basic requirements. Material safety data sheets, what they say in your book, but under HazCon 2012, uh, they're now referred to as safety data sheets to be more in line with global commerce, container labeling, employee training, and your program for hazard communication. So you are required to obtain and maintain uh, manufacturer data sheets from all manufacturers of products used or stored in the funeral home. The MSDS, or safety data sheet, must be supplied by the manufacturer at the time of shipment. Uh, if it isn't, you've got to get it as soon as possible. SDSs contain full disclosure of products hazard, precautions in handling, etc. Uh, the old rule, manufacturer's uh, safety data sheet, some could be like, you know, 
two or three pages double sided. Under the new rule, some of these are like 15 to 20 pages. They're huge. Funeral home must obtain four data sheets. Each product, um, our binder for to be put, blah, 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 blah. You have to obtain a binder, and all your safety data sheets need to be available. Now, I know under some of the modern reading, it's not covered in the book. I'm just going to tell you. I'm not going to test you on it. Is there are regulations regarding electronic storage because of their size? Some uh, workplaces have uh, like an iPad, and I believe the ruling is that as long as you have the physical binders somewhere where they're supposed to be, main office prep room, you can also use an electronic version such as an iPad for everything else. But the iPad, to my knowledge, you know, the electronic tablet is not a substitute for the physical binder. They need to be arranged in alphabetical order. Okay, alphabetical order, and you have to have an index. You should be able to open the binder, find the name quick, and go right to it without having to dig for it. The binder should be placed in the prep room or in a designated area with the copy in the main office as well. You may wish to keep a tablet in the prep room, binder you know where it can't get dirty, and a binder definitely in your main office. Labeling of containers, luckily, most of the products we use come pre-labeled by the manufacturers, and we don't have to worry about it. But it does have to have the name of the product, hazard warning, formalin, you know, 30%, whatever, name and address the manufacturer, and it is responsibility of the manufacturer, the importer, to provide you the label. The most hazardous products are typically pre-labeled. If you transfer a product from one container to your own, you must label your container. Memorize this exception. When the container is less than 10 gallons and used immediately, such as placing a chemical in a mop bucket for immediate use, you do not need to have a label. However, if the container is more than 10 gallons, even if it's used immediately, you probably have to have a label on it. If the container is less than 10 gallons and is going to be used tomorrow, you need to have a label on it. Okay? Your written hazard plan should contain the name of the person who is responsible for ensuring chemicals are labeled in the workplace. So you need a designated employee to make sure that your labeling is being done. There are nine pictograms used to convey hazards. The final hazard communication standards requires eight of the nine. The one that is not required is environmental hazard because HAZCOM, OSHA, does not protect the environment. That is the job of the Environmental Protection Agency. And there are, there are the different hazard categories. All of these are fair game, including the non-mandatory one. If I show you a picture, you should be able to tell me which one it is. Personally, I think the exploding bomb one's pretty cool. Employee training for HAZCOM. Funeral home must develop a written hazard communication program for all employees. All new employees go through process initial hire, probably the same time that they're going to be doing their formaldehyde training. All employees must be trained on new hazards they are introduced into the workplace. So again, we run into that, you know, what do we do? Remember, this is not funeral home specific. This is covering a blanket bunch of industries. I highly doubt that if you bring in a new formaldehyde hazard, you're going to have to train people on, uh, you know, you bought a new chemical from your favorite manufacturer. It's the same exact sort of stuff. It's a different color. Probably don't need to go crazy. However, if you bought a new fixing agent at a plastics manufacturer, liquid to powder or whatever, you would definitely want to retrain. Um, you will retrain people annually. So for formaldehyde and hazard communication, it's the same standard. At initial hire, retrain annually or whenever a new hazard is introduced into the workplace. Now, training records for hazard communication are not required to be kept for a time period by OSHA, although you may have state requirements. Okay. And I have extensively looked through the OSHA regulations to find whether or not you do or do not keep. Your program should include a bunch of stuff. I'm not going to list these all in the lecture. You can read it on your own. You should have some you know, common sense things. Methods to detect a hazardous chemical. Formaldehyde, you know, you've trained them specifically on formaldehyde. It can be ingested, inhaled, boom, boom, boom. Irritated. Um, Nasal mucosa, watery eyes, boom. Physical and health hazards of the chemicals, the different chemicals you use. Um, think about how many chemicals we use in a prep room. You know, just as preservatives, we might have alcohols, we have formalin-based products, we have 
in some limited circumstances, maybe a carbolic acid, a phenol-based, a coal tar derivative, for instance. Um, we have different types of disinfectants, glutaraldehyde, quats, etc. Plenty of things we need to talk about. And we talk about everything they do and their signs and symptoms and how they can get into us and make us miserable. Tells you how you can accomplish training. Well, you can either inform of each chemical, inform of each chemical in a room, or some of the hazards and overarching all the things that can happen. Um, you can see that it's pretty hardcore stuff, okay, pretty hardcore stuff. Remember, if a person is trying to plan a family, especially females, okay, formaldehyde is a known mutagen. It can have severe effects on developing um, embryos and fetuses. Generally, you do not want to be in the prep room. There was an article written um, a couple years ago, I think, in the Dodge magazine of a female embalmer who was planning a family and, you know, didn't want to give it up because of, you know, her passion for the industry. Um, I'm going to say, and this is my personal opinion, that that is not the type of message we need to send, okay? I know we want to help our families, but I also know that I want my family to be safe, my family to be safe. So if I can reduce the risk or best case scenario, eliminate it directly, I would probably take it. So utilize some good judgment uh, because you will pay for this for a lifetime. And the life you affect is not necessarily just yours in that case. So I do feel I have a professional responsibility to make you guys informed and make sure you make the right decisions for your own behalf. Um, if you do have to discuss things with your medical professionals, you may have to take, say, a safety data sheet or a picture or maybe uh, an actual chemical with you so that the doctor can review it and get some information. You need to have your written program, which outlines how you intend to comply with the standards of health. Uh, and this is maintained, i.e. kept up to date and made available to all employees. The last one we're going to look at is bloodborne pathogen. The standard was introduced in 88, became final in 93. There are six requirements, exposure control plan, Hep B, vaccination, PPEs, training, exposures, uh, when you have an exposure incident, and then record keeping. So the control plan, come on. This is like everything else. You need to have a plan to control and minimize exposure to bloodborne pathogens. And the things that must be in this plan are the job classifications which the employee, uh, of which employees have exposure to bloodborne pathogens. So you need to take an inventory of all your positions and which ones have exposure problems to this stuff. How you intend to implement precautions, what your training system is, what your record keeping is, um, the hepatitis B procedure how you offer it, how you keep the records, how often they should get, you know, re-immunized, uh, and procedure for evaluation of exposure incidents. You should look at it annually. List all classifications that have occupational exposure as well as those which have some. So, for instance, removal techs and embalmers. We have lots. We are in the category of have occupational exposure. Now, what about your part-time associates? Maybe pick up a body now and then, drive it to and from, or a secretary that might have to go in and get a signature in the prep room or something like that. They may have some, some occupational exposure. Generally, my rule of thumb for all of you is no matter what the test says or what, you know, you, you rule, train everyone. Train everyone as if they have occupational exposure. Then you don't have an issue. Engineering and work practice control should have PPEs, hand washing facilities, antiseptic hand cleanser for off-premises. Um, so you want to have some, you know, gel hidden in the vans. Sharps containers, eating, drinking, smoking, applying cosmetics, handling contacts, doing any crazy stuff in an environment we may come in contact with bloodborne pathogens or other potentially infectious materials, OPIMS. Okay, you see that there, O-P-I-M-S, other potentially infectious material, which is any other fluid or whatever than blood. So mucus, urine, um, spinal fluid, cranial fluid, etc. is an OPIM. Hep B. Funeral homes must make Hep B vaccinations available to employees who have exposure. Not some exposure, exposure. This must be at no cost to the employee at a reasonable time and place and after BBP training within 10 days of beginning work. So prior to exposure, within 10 days of actually beginning the job. If it is declined initially, employee wants it later, they can get it under the same conditions. Okay? If they decline the vaccination, they have to sign the declination form. 
they cannot be compelled to sign the declination form. If they want the shot, the employer has to provide it. That is not a choice. You have to provide it. You may go through the reimbursement where they go to the local health clinic and get it. They come back to work, provide immunization, and then you reimburse them for the expense, whatever. But they cannot be charged for it. They have to get it at zero cost. And if they decline it originally without coercion, if they want it later, they can get it at no cost. By now, it should be ingrained in you that we provide the employer, we, Royal We, provide the PPEs okay, at no cost, just like all the other occupational standards. And your training program at initial hire prior to exposure. So with the other ones, we've all seen at initial hire. It is your first day on onboarding. You should go through OSHA training and formaldehyde training. Now, for some reason, you cannot get bloodborne pathogen in that same day for time restrictions or whatever. Before you actually get into the removal vehicle, before you get actually into the prep room, you need to have the bloodborne pathogen training. This is whenever a new hazard introduced into the workplace and retraining annually thereafter. Now, this is a bit easier to delineate because when a new hazard is introduced into the workplace, generally we all know about it. So, for instance, Zika virus, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, Ebola, AIDS, HIV. When we hear something new that comes out, we train all of our employees to make sure they are aware. That is much easier for us to kind of wrap our minds around. And training sessions need to be conducted by individuals with expertise in bloodborne pathogens. Funeral directors, nurses, doctors, uh, health professionals. So you would not get someone that is a school bus driver that does not deal with bloodborne pathogen who stands up in front of a room and clicks through a PowerPoint. That's not the way it works. Training shall include all of these items. Many of them match what we've seen and change you know, some things afterwards. In the event of exposure, the employer must make available to the exposed employee post-exposure evaluation and follow-ups. If there is a job, um, if there is a workforce incident, you have to be able to give them the accommodations they need, the time to get their test, blood work, and probably cover their expenses. Warning label should be affixed to all containers of regulated waste, biomedical waste, and refrigerators containing blood or other potentially infectious material, anything other than blood. You should know what the biohazard sticker looks like. It should be fluorescent orange or red orange. Red bags for biomedical regulated waste containers. Labels have the three interlocking circles. That's the biohazard symbol. So training. Training must be kept for three years. I know your book says five, but the Department of Labor says three. And I give you the reference, the statute reference. Remember what I said? I looked all this up. It was not fun. Medical records are kept for length of employment plus 30 years. We've seen that over and over again. Medical records, length of employment plus 30 years. And do not confuse this with formaldehyde exposure records, which is only kept 30 years. Tells you what the medical record should have on it. This is kind of common sense. Name of employee, identifier, social security number, whether they've had their shots, what are their record of exposure incidents under bloodborne pathogen, and their medical evaluations, if any. The Needle Stick Safety and Prevention Act, NISPA, was an amendment to the BBP, Bloodborne Pathogen Standard. Okay? Requires funeral homes to have a written needle stick exposure control plan that is updated on an annual basis. The big thing here is the word parenteral. That is the term used to indicate a needle stick. Plan must set forth engineering controls to reduce the risk of injury from sharps such as needles, scalpels, syringes, even wires from the needle injector, the barb injector, the closed features. That can be considered a sharp. The National Funeral Directors Association recommends procedures. Read these. Okay, read these. These are important. So if you buy something sharp, keep the container it came in. Don't use cork. Cork is bad. Purchase tubing at your favorite home improvement store. Trocars, if you don't get a cover or the cover you know, gets disgusting or breaks or whatever, run down to your favorite home improvement store and buy some PVC and a cap for it. It is not hard. Make sure the PVC pipe that you're using or the tubing you are using is two inches longer than the trocar. You don't want anything sticking out too high. You want everything able to get disinfected and stored safely. Um, suture needles. Use a sponge with disinfectant. When putting things into areas that have sharps, that have um, 
may be contaminated. Use forceps or hemostats. Never use your hands. And when take up blades, disposable blades off of handles, always use forceps or hemostats, instruments, engineering controls. Never use your hands. When disposing of sharp instruments, you need to use a sharps container. It needs to be closable, puncture resistant, leak proof on bottom and sides, label or color coded, maintained upright during use. Okay, you're not supposed to drop it on its side to throw stuff in it. You don't want things to spill out. And when you're ready to dispose of it, it's placed in a secondary leak proof container, a biohazard box upon disposal. Check your local laws. That would be important. Okay. Um, I've run into some issues with my local health officials because one year they told me I need to put it in the biohazard box like it says here in the slide. The next year when they say, well, how do you get rid of your sharps containers? Oh, I put it inside the biohazard box and we ship it. Well, how do I know that you've done that? My initial response, you know, ready to slap the guy across the head and say, because you don't see any locked and ready to go biohazard boxes. And then it was, well, those need to be shipped separately. You need to have a record of the Sharps container being sent with a label and everything like a biohazard box, which is in derogation to the local codes and everything that I know of. So then the next year, another inspector comes in, and I ask that same question, what do you want me to do? And the guy says, oh, you put it in the big box and you ship it out, of course. And I said, well, that's not what they told me last year. So, okay, whatever. Know what the laws are. Okay, know what the laws are. And then don't argue with people. It's just not worth it. Just do what you're told. If they write you up, they write you up. Non-sharp materials, other potentially infectious materials. So, um, blood, bloodied clothing, um, bodily fluid contaminated uh, materials, sheets, whatever. These are going to container that is closable, puncture resistant, leak proof, labeled or color coded, closed prior to removal, and placed in a secondary leak proof container or biohazard box. Now, the ideal way to accommodate everybody would be that I would have one biohazard box ready to go before my biomedical waste transporter shows up, have him scan the label and then of my sharps container and then drop it into the box that it will be shipped with. So there is a very easy way to accommodate, which is what I basically did. It just had to stop the biomedical guy every single time he came so I could have him zap the sharps container, um, which can be a problem if you're not in the building when they show up and say you're a part-time person or your concierge doesn't know. So make sure that you know you do whatever it takes to stay in compliance and make everyone happy. Folks, this was a long one. Thank you for your attention. We will see you next time.